On July 21, 1993, Dr. Avraham Biran, an Israeli archaeologist, discovered a remarkable stone bearing an inscription written in ancient Aramaic. He had found the first reference outside the Bible to King David and a ruling dynasty, evidence of the House of David. Raise up a king, one of your own. Call him to lead us, establish his throne. I have chosen a shepherd after my heart. He Shalom. Hello again. I was just uh, looking at the story of David being brought to Saul because he was a good musician. We're at David's Tower and we're looking at his life and legacy. David's Tower is a uh, legacy of his, uh, not really of his, but over time it was thought that he had built this magnificent place. It really uh, has been enhanced over the ages by many people. Uh, it's a good place though uh, to look back at that fascinating life. As a shepherd, David may have begun his uh, music. He, the solitude is a wonderful uh, atmosphere in which to compose. And it seems that uh, one of uh, Saul's assistants knew about his talent. If we look in uh, 1 Samuel uh, 16, 14, a peculiar scene, Saul is troubled by an evil spirit. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. In verse 16, let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And often a musician will be the solution to depression. And they do that. Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. And in verse 18, then answered one of the servants and said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. That's highly recommended, comes David. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David, thy son, which is with the sheep. So uh, David uh, was uh, summoned to the palace, and that is how he originally came into the service of King Saul. Uh, harps are made today in Israel. Mika and Shoshana Harari have a harp shop and have made them for years. Our producer, Ken Berg, went to see what goes on in the creation of a harp. Shoshana, can you tell us what brought about your interest in harps? I met my husband in California and he was making instruments at the time and I felt that I needed an instrument to express myself. That the piano and the guitar, although they're nice instruments, they really weren't for me. And somewhere, I don't really know exactly, maybe from heaven, I had an idea that I wanted to play a small harp. I could relate to it. I'd never seen one, but I wanted to play it. So eventually, we came to Israel, and in Israel, um, a few years later, when he was already a carpenter, we came across an archaeological drawing that's dated to be, by archaeologists to be about 3,000 years old. It's called the Megiddo Harpist, and it shows a picture of a cave drawing in Megiddo of a man and his Neville, what's known as the Neville. So he took that as his design, and without telling me about it, he started to work on this harp for me. It was really just for me for my birthday. So he put it together as best he could, and as chance would have it, or whatever, destiny, <laughs> um, a neighbor who happened to be a journalist for the Jerusalem Post, she was, came by to visit, and she saw what he was doing, and she got very excited. She went back and did her research, and she discovered that these were the first harps to be made in Israel in 2,000 years. And she wrote an article about it, went out all over the world, and before you know it, without just making one for me, we had orders from, we became harp makers. It was not intentional. And in a sense, what we did is we stepped into the future. Okay, so now that you've been in Israel for a period of time, you've become experts in harp making. 
<laughs> well, we're still learning. We're learning all the time. And um, what happened is through these, uh, through interviews just like this, people would ask us a lot of very important questions, and we had to go back to the sources. We had to go back to the Bible. We had to go back to archaeology and the Talmud, which speaks about many of the details as far as the number of strings and things like that, to put a well-rounded picture of what these harps really were, and most importantly, what their purpose was. Because the actual way that David's harp looked, I mean, no one knows except David and God. But um, the purpose of them is clear. The purpose of David playing his harp was to release from the very depths of his soul the yearning to connect with the creator of the universe. And that is what we really impart to the people who are connected with these harps, who buy them, who use them. I tell them to go in the tradition of David, because David didn't go to a conservatory. He sat in the field. He played with the sheep, and he expressed himself through this beautiful, this beautiful music. Since the last time we interviewed the Harari several years ago, they have moved the manufacturing process to a warehouse located in an industrial part of West Jerusalem. To explain the process of making a harp, here is Micha Harari. A lot of our woods come from uh, Africa like in the times of the Bible when she, the Queen of Sheba sent uh, boatloads of wood to uh, Israel and the uh, instruments of the temple were made from those woods. So we actually use a lot of those woods. And the first thing we do is we dry the wood for you know, two or three years. We cut it down to approximate size, then we dry it some more, and then we begin to cut out the basic shapes of the instruments. After we roughly cut it out, we hand sand it for uh, a long time until we, make, uh, until we get the shape that we want. After that, we finish it, and um, over there we wax the pieces. And uh, after that, we string them, and um, then we send them to their new homes. The harp is a spiritual instrument, and it's the national instrument of Israel. It was always used just for joy. And um, um, our mission is to, uh, you know, to spread joy th with these harps. And we hope that when the next temple is built, that we'll be building the harps for them. Micha and Shoshi do care where their harps are going. They have high hopes for the ultimate use of their musical creations. Will your harps, in fact, be part of, of wor worship and music in the Third Temple? Well, I hope so. That's our prayer. I understand some of your harps are, are ready prepared for worship. Is that correct, in the sure. Temple? Sure. Actually, they're all prepared that way. But the more harps we make, we've been doing this now for 10 years, and the more harps that we make, the better we get at making them. And hopefully, they'll be worthy for the, uh, the services that are going to happen then, because it's going to be something that's never happened before. Like the music and everything that happened in the first temple is not what happened in the second temple. And what happened in the second temple is going to be nothing like what's going to happen in the third temple. These are instruments of musical prayer. So working as closely with these instruments as, as you have, do, do you feel that it somehow it's brought you closer to an understanding of David and of the Psalms, let's say? Well, for sure it's been understanding of David, but beyond David, it's brought us a closer understanding to God because um, it says that uh, uh, David was a man after God's own heart, and the Psalms were uh, an expression of his heart. So if we can understand, even whatever level we understand it, what was going on in David's heart, we can also understand to a tiny degree what's going on in God's heart and how he loves us and what he wants from us. You're saying that in an age where of contemporary music with drums and, and the like, electronic sound, that there's still a place for the music of the harp. I think there's actually more of a place for the sound of the harp, especially these harps, because they're very small and they're meant for real people. It's not the kind of a thing where you have to sit and practice scales all day. It's the kind of a thing you pick up when you're inspired. When you want to hear something that you can do it's very simple and lovely and connects you with the, the part of your spirit that you really want to be connected with, that can give you peace in a world of turmoil. What is your inner feeling when you're playing the harp? It's a very, very pure feeling. The sound of the harp is, very, is pure. Um, 
Well, most other stringed instruments have something, either a fret or a bow going over them like the violin and things. The sound of the harp is completely pure. I just feel joy. I think that's it. It's an instrument of joy, which is why it was, it was hung upon the willow trees when our ancestors went into exile, because they couldn't take a joyful instrument into a sad time. And the fact that it's returned now, to me, definitely is a sign that joy, after the, the door we have to pass through, <laughs> is coming. The music uh, really did work on King Saul. We look in the scripture in 1 Samuel 16, 23, it says, And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Uh, David became important in the government. He was next to the king. Today we have no king, but the prime minister is the most important official in the government. When we return, we'll have the opportunity to talk with former Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Shamir. We will have here a state of uh, 10 million or more, and it will be a very prosperous state, a strong state, and uh, it will exist forever. Well, I was introduced to it through my mother. Actually, she told me to watch Zola on the uh, on the TV, and I happened to turn it on, and I was really impressed with Zola and, and what he had to say, and uh, uh, it looked like a, re a really good tour. There were so many great events. The Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, and especially the uh, baptism in the River Jordan was very emotional time for me and, and very meaningful. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. Call or write for more information. Uh, Mr. Shamir, uh, first of all, of course, the peace process. You're a part of it, and you're watching it like the rest of us. What do you think? Well, you know, uh, I am very skeptical about it, and I am very opposed to this uh, policy of the Israeli government in this regard. I think that the agreement with the PLO was a very grave blunder. Uh -huh. A blunder? It was a blunder. It is a blunder. And it endangers the future in the interests of Israel, the security of Israel. I supported always uh, any peace efforts. I think it's important for any nation to live in peace with its neighbors. But I have preferred peace with countries on which you can rely that they will be able to implement their commitments. In this case, if you have an agreement with a terrorist organization, one among others, other terrorist organizations, you cannot rely on them. Arafat was never a man of his word, and he is well known for his inclination to change every day the, uh, the, his commitments. And it changed already several times. And it's clear that he will not, uh, he will not keep his commitments. What he's speaking now is about Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinian state. And in this uh, agreement he had with uh, with Israel, there is not a word about Jerusalem or about the Palestinian state, and uh, well, he does what he wants. I guess uh, the argument would be uh, better Arafat and a disorganized PLO than the alternative, Hamas or something. Well, it's uh, nonsense. It's nonsense, you know. 
the uh, victory over uh, the PLO, which was very near, very realistic, uh, could be a very great victory for Israel. And it could uh, convince a great part of the Arab uh, nations and all the Palestinians that you cannot to dominate and to conquer a war against Israel by violence. Israel is much stronger. You can get something from Israel by uh, conviction, by, uh, by negotiations, but not by violence. And we miss this opportunity. The Likud in general uh, is, of course, you're the opposition, so you take an opposite view. But on the behavior of the Palestinians and everything else, Likud is looking smarter every day. When we talked to Mr. Netanyahu, uh, the Likud leader, uh, last week, uh, he said that at the beginning, most of the nation really was in favor of trying some kind of peace process with the Palestinians. Now he says most are against it. Yes, it's a fact that uh, in the beginning it was a kind of a euphoria uh -huh. because everybody wants peace, you know. Every individual prefers to have peace for uh, his own personal interests. Yes, sir. And, but uh, now people see that it's not so, that the situation is not like it was described a year ago or so. Uh, less than a year ago, and uh, the public opinion, I think, is now different. There have to be some arrangements with the Palestinians to give them more opportunities to express their uh, willingness to be more independent, but you cannot in such a small country to establish two states. It's impossible. And Jerusalem, <laughs> it's a consensus by the Israeli uh, nation that Jerusalem has to be the capital of the state of Israel. Nobody could imagine a state of Israel without Jerusalem as its capital. Arafat, though. <laughs> Arafat, <laughs> yes. Well, well, well. The, therefore, I think it's not a peace. If somebody wants to get your capital and to make of it his capital, you cannot make peace with him. Well, the way the story goes, I guess he would say, uh, we've always been here, the Jews came lately, Jerusalem no, was ours. You know, it's not a truth. The Palestinians have never been here as a nation, not in Israel, not in Jerusalem. They've never, they've never had a nation at an independent state. And Jerusalem was never an Arab capital, never in its history, for 3,000 years. Uh -huh. King David actually made it the capital of Israel sure, sure. 3,000 years ago. Our series of programs focuses on that time because it's sort of similar to this time. He was trying to make a peace process with uh, enemies on the borders and in the country yeah. and so on. <laughs> God said in the Bible that uh, there would always be a ruler of King David's house to, to take care of Israel. Yes, of course. Does it seem to you that we're uh, with peace and everything else? Is there a messianic age coming? Are things going to get better? Well, I, I believe in it and I trust that it will become better. And I think we will have our state here. We will have many immigrants. Our population, our Jewish population, will grow. And uh, we will have here a state of uh, 10 million or more. And it will be a very prosperous state, a strong state. And uh, it will exist forever. That's very biblical, too. <laughs> well, of course, you know. <laughs> The Bible, the Bible is uh, the uh, foundation, the foundation of our, the, of our uh, nation, of our national spirit, of our national uh, faith. You cannot imagine a Jewish people, a, a Jewish state, without the Bible as its 
spiritual constitution. Do you feel you're getting support from the other biblical people, the Christian people? Yes, of course, there is. There is uh, an important support from many Christian communities in the world. Uh, not from official bodies, not from uh, states or what, but uh, from many, many organizations, and we are encouraged by this. Yeah. But uh, Muslim people also claim the Bible, but uh, take a different view where Israel's concerned. Well, for them the Bible is not important, and uh, the, the, the Muslim people, they, uh, they don't attach any importance to peace, to democracy, and well, in the contrary, for them, as you know, the law of the Quran is that uh, Muhammad has to, has to govern, to dominate the world by thought. By a sword. By sword. Yeah. And this, until this day, it's accepted by all the Muslim uh, states and countries. Uh, Arafat, as a matter of fact, said it, uh, used the word jihad, jihad in well, terms of Jerusalem, a holy war to regain you know, Jerusalem. Of course, of course. Not only Jerusalem. He speaks about Jerusalem, but he has in mind all of Palestine. Uh -huh. All of Israel. All of Israel. You, you rose from a, a foot soldier, a freedom fighter, all the way to be prime minister of your nation. You have a very broad view of decades of Israel and its relations in the world. We have a million people watching in America. Can you make a statement? Well, uh, I can say to all our friends, and we have many friends in the United States. I must say that uh, the United States is the most friendly nation to Israel, towards Israel. In the United States, it's a bipartisan policy. And uh, we, are, uh, we have an experience, a long experience, of a very uh, intimate uh, cooperation between Israel and the United States, uh, and a co cooperation that's, that was very useful to both countries. And I can say that it is in the interests of humanity, of entire humanity, and of the United States and the Western world to have here a strong and sound Israeli democracy. And I hope that we will have it and we will work together. Thank you for this interview. Well, you're welcome. I always see you in the meadows. I always hear you by the stream. I see you in the mountains, Lord, in shining splendor, calling out to me as in a dream. I call out your name. You hear my voice, I hear you call me, my chosen, hold a place for me, there beside your throne. Hold a place for me there beside your throne. I'll follow you forever. We can uh, <laughs> all get with that. That's, that's the goal of any believer. David wrote it in Psalm 110. Uh, it begins this way. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Uh, Peter quoted it at Pentecost. And, of course, it's the goal of all believers. David was the prime minister of his country, like Shamir, you might say. Back then, of course, it was a monarchy, and he was the king. But he was also a poet, uh, a composer, a harpist, and, and we saw that 
Uh, we have our own Harari harp, um, which is, uh, of course, a Bible harp, as was explained. Let me try to play a little of our theme song of the series on this harp. I'm not really a harpist now. It really does have a pretty sound. Um, like Prime Minister Shamir, you know, David was, was a fighting national leader who consolidated boundaries, kept an eye on the enemy, kept his country strong, leading to the administration we see now of Prime Minister Shamir, uh, rather uh, Prime Minister Rabin, the peacemaker. Uh, just as David's uh, border consolidation led to his son Solomon, the peacemaker. Hopefully there will be a time of peace um, if we lo continue looking back at history. After Solomon, the nation was divided and weakened, and uh, <laughs> peace did not ensue. As a matter of fact, Israel was raided, and I wonder if it was, uh, you know, that's when the ten tribes were carried off. A, a prediction, I hope not, uh, of... Uh, of our times, if the end comes, in other words, Israel will be made smaller, first of all, divided by this peace process, and then uh, assaulted by the Antichrist in the tribulation period. It could be a parallel of that time of 3,000 years ago. One reason we made the House of David series is our times so resemble uh, the times back then. Uh, how do I know all these things? Uh, <laughs> it's Jewish roots. If you know your Jewish roots, Christianity is, is so filled out, so colored in for you. It, it, has, it has history. It has a, a greater and greater meaning. Uh, we have a tape series called Discovering Our Jewish Roots. Ann Snell and Carl Ackerman Hunter were teaching these lessons in churches, and, and the people were galvanized. Even seminary people were galvanized. Seminaries don't teach much about Israel, don't know much about Israel. Uh, why is, I don't know, but uh, uh, it's mentioned on every page here. But in any case, uh, when these Sunday school teacher type ladies came in teaching, they were fascinated. I was too when I heard the tapes. I was really struck, and uh, I learned some things, and I, th I wanted to pass them on to you. So uh, we uh, asked them if we could distribute these things, and so we'll distribute them uh, to you, if you will have it, discovering our Jewish roots, uh, wonderful lessons, thirty-nine dollars. Uh, just call uh, the uh, eight hundred number with your credit card, or uh, we'll serve you by mail. Discovering our Jewish roots, and uh, we'll offer you also the cassette tape of all the music for the House of David series, uh, twelve dollars. Uh, you'll hear the songs in all the programs, beautifully orchestrated. You get a word sheet, and it's a lot of fun to have. Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. 